there is so much we could say about Jesus, right? There is so much we could say. We could spend days, months, perhaps years analyzing different parts, aspects of the real reality of Jesus Christ and what he represents for us Seventh-day Adventist Christians. But I could summarize it in, uh, uh, in these few words. Jesus Christ is everything. If you want to make sense of Christianity, you must know Jesus Christ. We can speak of Buddhism without Buddha. We can speak of Mormonism without Joseph Smith. And it's even possible to speak about Islamism without mentioning Muhammad. But you cannot speak about Christianity without talking of Jesus Christ. In fact, uh, Christianity is the most probably the most radical of all religions because Jesus made some radical claims. He said that he is the way, that he is the truth and the life. And nobody comes to the Father except through me, he said. So to be a Christian, you really need to believe in what Jesus says because either he was really who he said he was or he was a crazy person who created a, the greatest fraud. So there's a lot that um, we don't understand about how Jesus can be God because when you think about it, how could God know everything? How could God be everywhere? How, how, how come God is able to do everything? All those questions are beyond our imagination. How come he doesn't have a beginning or end? How come he is eternal? How can God be three and yet one? There's so much we don't know. But here is something that we can understand, that God was made flesh and he dwelt among us. I'd like to show you this illustration, the illustration of the, the elephant. Uh, there is a story of, um, that tells us of blind men who uh, met an elephant for the first time. Uh, the story varies, this, this parable varies. Sometimes it's only three men, four men, but... It goes like this. These blind men, they're trying to describe what was in front of them. They don't know what an elephant is. One of them says, ah, oh, it's a huge snake because he's holding the trunk. Oh, it's a huge wall, the one touching the side of the elephant. The one that's uh, holding the ears thinks, oh, it's a, it's, a, it's a mat. But the other one near the legs says, no, no, it's a strong column. The one at the back says, no way, guys. This is just a rope holding the tail. But no one was right. You know, atheists actually take this illustration and they say that um, each religion claims that God is such and such, but no one knows, and it's like these blind men. But I'd like to ask you, is Christianity also blind like that? No, it's not. Because the Bible says that God has a face, Jesus Christ. And sure, at times uh, it makes people confused. <laughs> because um, Jesus said, if you see me, you see the Father. The Father and I are one. The angels of God adore me. I am the first and the last. I you know, he, he said, I walk on waters. I can cure the blind. I can forgive sins. And at the same time, he says, the Father sent me. The, the Father is greater than me. Without, without the Father, I can do nothing. So, do we believe Jesus Christ is God or someone under God? Well, take your Bibles and let's go to the book of John. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And before we read, we're going to have another prayer um, to uh, request the Holy Spirit to give us more insight and understanding this morning. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to be with you. We thank you that when we come in your presence, we are transformed. And this morning, Heavenly Father, as we open your word, we pray that you will please God. Enable us to capture the, capture the essence of the guidance that you've given to us. Help us, Lord, 
to comprehend more about you. And may that be a life-changing experience for us. Please, Father, send us your Holy Spirit. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. John chapter 1, verse 1. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was God. Was God. There's no doubt there. Jesus Christ was God. Equal in every single sense, nothing was made in this world without Jesus. Then we get to verse 14. Take a look. Verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And now take a look at verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. You know, I enjoy watching the birds at, uh, that come to my backyard. In fact, uh, just behind this camera, uh, I can see my backyard. And uh, birds come there every day. And I often leave food scraps for them and grains. There are actually some doves that live on, on my roof. And they're always here. And, but the thing is, as soon as they come to my backyard and they and they notice me, even if I make a slight movement here behind the windows, they fly away swiftly in fear. Even though I care for them, I'm not going to hurt them, I feed them, they are extremely frightened of me. They don't know how much I care. And I, how could I approach these birds without scaring them? What do you think? You know, maybe what I would need to do was to become one of them. I would need to become a bird. This way I would become their friend. Though there was still a risk of them rejecting me, right? And that's what happened to Jesus. He was one with God. He was God. But in order to fully Re, uh, reveal his heart, his desire towards us without scaring us away. He had to become one of us. You know, God, he didn't have to do this. Um, he could have done it in a different way, I guess. Jesus didn't have to take humanity, but he did it because of you, because you need it, because I need it. Well, let's go to Acts chapter 3 and uh, read a bit more about Jesus and what happened to his nature. Jesus, Acts, uh, Acts chapter 3, and we read verses 20 and 21. Jesus Christ, uh, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began, to him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. All the prophets through the history, including the Old Testament, witnessed of him. Now let's go to chapter 10 of Acts. Chapter 10, verse 43. Chapter 10. Oh, that's the one. To him, all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remissions of sin. These are the texts that show that Jesus was a center in the Old Testament. There's another well-known verse that's in John chapter 5, verse 39, that tells us where Jesus said, You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. And of course, uh, Jesus really believed in that because when he met with the two disciples in the road to Emmaus, what did he do? What did he say to them? The Bible says that he opened the scriptures to tell and show them how the Old Testament had spoken about the Messiah. Who is the center of the Old Testament? It's Christ. 
And who is the center of the New Testament? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 22. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. To Paul, Jesus was the center of the New Testament as well. Jesus is the center of the Bible. Now let's ask some questions. Did Jesus exist before he came to the world? Yes, um, this may be obvious to you, but some people may not know. So let's have a look at some verses and see what they tell us. Uh, open in the book of Micah in the Old Testament, towards the end of Old Testament, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And it says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be the ruler of, in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. So this text shows us that Jesus has always existed from everlasting. Now turn to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. This was a prophecy about the coming of the Messiah. And Isaiah wrote, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. A prophecy about baby Jesus. And what does Isaiah call him? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Don't miss that point that Jesus is called Father. Yeah. They're all names for God. And names that reveal his character, his nature. One, and one of his names is Son of God. Another name is Eternal Father. Jesus is Mighty God. Now we're going to go all the way to the New Testament, to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1, and we will read verses 5 and 6. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. And it's written, For God never said to any angel what he said to Jesus. You are my son. Today I have become your father. God, will also, God also said, I will be his father and he will be my son. And when he brought his supreme son into the world, God said, let all God's angels worship him. Notice, the father wasn't his father before, in the sense of Jesus didn't come from the father, out of the father before. But Jesus and the father take that representative figure only when Jesus comes down. And that's why he says, I will become your father, and you will become my son. Because one is not higher than the other. Sometimes people think that when they're reading their Bibles, son of God, it means that uh, the father and the son means that the father is higher. No, there's no such a thing. Jesus and the father are the same. They're equal. But because of the incarnation of Jesus, they took new names and new representations so we may better understand God. So when Jesus was born, he wasn't born like we are born. He was inserted into the world, like in Hebrews it says, God sent him into the world. He was inserted into the world. He was sent. It means he existed before he was born. He was there in eternity. So Jesus is God, and he existed before he was born on earth. But the big question at the time, and it's still for us today, how can God be so big and at the same time so small? How could Jesus be the greatest in all glory and at the same time be the smallest, the big and the, and the greatest sufferer? You know, I will read the text that where he says, He is mighty God. Let all the angels worship him. There's also the text where we read, that he would be punished for our transgressions and counted among thieves. How can God be so great and yet so small? 
the Jews, they asked themselves this question, um, even in the Talmud. Um, they asked, looking at their prophecies, they asked, will the Messiah come in glory and majesty as Daniel announced, or will he come mounted on a donkey as prophesied by prophet Zechariah? They, the Jews could not really figure out. The Messiah is presented as someone who is so great and at the same time someone who is so despised, divine and human. The Messiah, like everything about God, simply doesn't fit our human understanding, right? Go to Exodus. Exodus chapter 15, verse 11, the, a question was asked, Who among the gods is like you, Lord? The other day I was watching a movie on the life of Christ on YouTube. And there's actually a pretty good movie there that uh, uh, follows line by line uh, the Gospel of Luke. And I usually enjoy reading the comment sessions session on uh, section on uh, YouTube and there was a comment by a person I believe I believe uh, a Muslim who could not his get uh, his mind around the fact that we believe that Christ is God he was saying are you crazy he wrote how can you believe God would become human and then why would he allow himself to be killed it just doesn't make sense he wrote this down and I know right the gospel seem seems like foolishness to some but what many don't understand is that God is not like any God our minds could ever devise so God Jesus turned into a human yes that's what John chapter 1 verse 14 says that he was made flesh and he inhabited among among us now God has always wanted to be with us it was sin that caused the separation. So God has been working to reunite us with him. You know, he asked the Israelites to set up a tent, a tabernacle, so he could live among them. And, and of course, Jesus came down, his own body, a temple dwelling with people. It's interesting, uh, some words we find in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5, where it's, it's written, Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. Jesus became a human being. I hope you're marking this down with a pen so you can come back to this later in case somebody asks you more questions about Jesus. When Jesus became a human do you think he became 80% human, 50% human and 50% God, 20% human? What do you think? And when he was born, do you think he knew he was God? Do you think Jesus ever made a math mistake? You know, I, 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 I'm not that, that good at math. Um, so I've made some mistakes, but do you think Jesus ever made a math mistake? Would, would Jesus get the top grades on his PhD? Or when Jesus sang, do you think he, he ever sang a wrong note? Did Jesus ever have a headache? Was he the sport, the best sportsman? Did he excel in everything he did? You know, when I was young, uh, there was a, it was common to refer to the intelligence quotient of a person based on a performance on tests. Do you remember that? But um, nowadays, it's well known that there's a variety of types of intelligence. So somebody who memorizes things fast may not be a good public speaker. And a person who is a, uh, who is a good driver may not necessarily be a good singer. So... Why do we think that Jesus could do everything better than us? Because remember, Jesus came as a human being. He faced sin like we face. 
Yes, he, he had a clean mind, completely pure. He was born with the unfallen nature of Adam in mental and in spiritual terms. But in physical terms, Jesus had the same body as any Jew of his time. And he had fever, he hungered, he got thirst. You know, if Jesus was here, where he was here today, perhaps he could even catch coronavirus. Look at uh, what Luke chapter 2 says. Luke chapter 2, verse um, 40 and verse 52. And the child grew and became strong, and he was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. That's verse 40. And verse 52 says, And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, and favor with God and man. You see what it says here? Jesus grew. So he grew. So he went through all the phases of human growth. He was a child and he became a teenager. He lost teeth. Maybe he, he had a bit of a pimple breakout. Who knows? Everything that a human being goes through happened to Jesus. He, and the Bible says that he grew healthy and strong. And that he gained wisdom. He grew in wisdom. Isn't that incredible that a perfect, etern eternal God can grow? It says here, he grew in wisdom. I mean, in his divine form, he knew everything. But when he became a child, he had to gain knowledge and gain wisdom. He had to learn that he was the child. God. Wow. Wow. Matthew chapter 8, verse 24. It tells us that when there was a storm one day and the disciples were in a boat, it says here, the waves were sweeping over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. Why was Jesus sleeping? Because he got tired. Jesus slept. Jesus got scared too. He got stressed out. So much, so stressed one time that he was even sweating blood. Jesus got thirsty. We see several times him asking for water. When he had to carry that heavy cross, he lost his strength. He couldn't, he couldn't carry the cross. Somebody had to do it for him. Jesus was fully human. Jesus took up the human nature. Why did he do that? Because Satan had accused God. God of establishing laws that are impossible for humans to obey. Satan said that God was the one to blame for human failure. So what did Jesus do? He came as a human to prove that God is not unfair. He faced the devil like each one of us has to face the devil. In fact, I reckon that he faced the devil in a, it was in a much worse way because the devil doesn't tempt you to doubt that you are God. You don't have that temptation. But Jesus was tempted that way. So Jesus was tempted in everything we are and more. He had fears. He had hunger. He had thirst. He was tempted by evil. But it's important to remind you he had no sin. In his whole life, he never committed a moral mistake in thought or in action. But he was still human. Let's read what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. It says there, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He was and he is eternal God, but out of his great love for you, he chose to do the unthinkable and he took humanity upon himself. There's a really, um, there's a powerful uh, passage that we're going to read now that tells us the measure, the extent of this decision of Christ. It is found in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. Philippians chapter 2. And we read in verse 5, 
in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God. Something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. The words here that you read, he made himself nothing. Um, Paul uses a Greek word there in verse 7 when he says that Jesus gave up his divine privileges. And the word is the word kenosis. This word means to empty yourself. So he emptied himself. He let go of himself. Uh, it's like taking a, a jar of juice and pouring the content. It's like taking a bag of flour and and pouring the content and blowing it away, Jesus poured himself, kenosis. This is the word that Paul used to explain what Christ did to himself. You know, some scholars, they based on Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22, they believe that the kenosis of Jesus, his, his humbling of himself, didn't begin at the time of the incarnation as a baby. They reckon that it actually began much earlier at the time of creation. And why did they believe so? Because they reckon that Jesus um, had, from the start, had to veil his glory in order to appear to angels and humans. A few scholars, they asked this question, you know, they ask you this question, what is the size of God? I ask you this question, what is the size of God? Is God 20 meters? Is God 100 meters? Is there anyone in the universe who can fully know God and his size? Who is able to fully know God? Only God. God is that great that only God can know himself. So how could a God so big make himself known to us? There's a doctor called uh, Richard Dave Davidson. He affirms that there's only one way that God could reveal himself to us. Do you know how? God needed to hide himself. Because his glory is so great, so great, that the only way that we may know him is if he hides some of his glory. And Jesus Christ was the person in the Godhead who voluntarily took the challenge, the limitation to make God known to us, to make God more comprehensible to us. And that is why Jesus became a human. When he lived here, he seemed so small. That's why the Father would speak and, and he would obey. He became the image of an invisible, glorious God to us. And that confirms this incredible verse found in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, that says, Christ is the invisible, the visible image of the invisible God. It makes sense, doesn't it? Because we read uh, in John chapter 1, verse 1, that the Word was in the beginning, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. With God and is God. The Word. It's like a mediating Word. A Word that presents God to us. In Genesis chapter 19, you look there from verses uh, 10 to 12, well, in the, in the, in the chapter, there's a story. Uh, there's a story of uh, Abraham and Isaac, and uh, Isaac is going to sacrifice Isaac. It's a test. 
And he's about to sacrifice his son. It's a test of faith. And he's about to sacrifice his son. And who turns up and holds Abraham's hand? The Bible says there in chapter 19, verses 10 to 12, that it's an angel, the angel of the Lord. So it says the angel of the Lord. And what does the angel say to Abraham? Look at verse 12, Genesis 19, verse 12. The angel said, do not lay a hand on the boy. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Wait, uh, Abraham had promised to give his son to an angel or to God? To God. So was that any angel that was appearing to him and saying, I've seen that you have given your son to me. Was that any angel? No. That angel was God in the form of an angel. And um, another story that this comes to light when Jacob was fighting a stranger all night. Remember that stranger that he fought with and who put his hips out of joint? Jacob fought with an angel. But then it says that uh, Jacob's name was changed. Jacob's uh, name was changed. And what was his name changed to? Israel. Do you know the meaning of Israel? Israel means ish, which means man, ra, against <laughs> el, God. Israel means a man who fought against God. But did he fight an angel or did he fight God? What do you think? <coughs> it was God in the form of an angel. Jesus appeared several times as an angel, the angel of the Lord. Even in heaven, he was also Michael, the archangel, the prince of the heavenly hosts. Another name for Jesus, another uh, one of his manifestations, visible manifestations of God, Michael. Do you want a, another proof uh, that Jesus is Michael? Doesn't the Bible say that... Uh, uh, in Matthew, that the dead will hear the voice of Christ, the Son of Man, when, when, they, when He comes, and the dead will resurrect. Doesn't, doesn't Jesus say that? So Jesus says, the dead will hear my voice. But then when it comes to Paul in Thessalonians, what does he say? The dead will rise when they hear the voice of the archangel. Interesting. Is it the voice of Jesus or is it the voice of the archangel or is Jesus the archangel? Plus, the meaning of the word Michael is nobody like God. So Jesus had already long ago humbled himself to appear as an angel in order to enable, to facilitate the communication of the Godhead with his creatures, with his children, starting with the angels. And then humans. I mean, how could God, in his greatness, in his glory, go with the angels somewhere if he was everywhere? How could he go with them somewhere if he was everywhere? What did God have to chat with the angels if he already knew everything about them? Have you ever asked yourself those questions? How can you have, uh, how, can, how can there be a relationship between finite beings with an, infi with an internal being, with an eternal being. How can that relationship happen? It is possible if God veils his glory. Then we come to an interesting verse in John chapter 10, where Jesus is speaking to the Jews, the Pharisees, he says to them in verse 58, John 10, 58, he says, Surely I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. 
he says, here he's saying that he is God because um, the, the next verse says that when the Jews heard this, they picked up stones to stone him because they were accusing him of blasphemy. He was saying that he was God. Yeah, he'd said, before Abraham was, I am. Where else do we see the name of God, the I am? Where else? For example, Exodus 3. Moses, in this chapter, he's in the desert. He's hiding from Pharaoh. Spending 40 years there, now looking after sheep. But God has a mission for him. To go and speak and set the people of Israel free. And in order to appear to Moses and talk to him, in order to avail his glory, it doesn't kill the man. What does God do? He makes a bush catch on fire. And the bush is not burning. The bush is on flames, but it's as green as always. But it catches the attention of Moses. And out of that fire, God speaks. And what does God say to Moses? Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent you. Who is the I am? God. And who does Jesus say he is? The I am. It was Jesus speaking to Moses through that fiery bush. Jesus, the visible image of the invisible God. God's mouthpiece to humans. The Word, always desiring to have a relationship with us. But here's the problem. Sin arrived. And sin caused separation between God and us. And to save us from sin, to save us from eternal death. What kind of death did Jesus have to face? What kind of death, my friends? Death on the cross. You know, Rome crucified thousands of people, right? So you can say, yeah, it was the kind of death, was the death of the cross. But listen, because Roman, Romans crucified lots of people, did that mean, does that mean that those thousands of people who died also died on the cross to save us? No. Is there anything else to the death of, on the cross that Christ faced? What kind of death was that death that Jesus had to face? What kind of death was that? It was eternal death. There are many Bible verses that tell us so. That Jesus had to die the eternal death. Now here's a, a quick story for you. Uh, there was a king who issued a law in his kingdom that uh, anyone who was found stealing something would get their eyes blacked out. And because of that, after the law, there was no more theft in the kingdom. And people didn't have to worry about getting anything stolen. So there were no locks, no gates. No one had to worry about it. Until one day, somebody came to the king and said, Majesty, a young man was caught stealing. And the law says that his eyes must be pulled out, plucked out. The king replied, well, then the law must be applied. But king, the young man is the prince, your son. What do you think the king did? If he changed the law, what would others say? Ah, oh, there we go. When it's his own family, he changes the law. He is so unfair. But if he applied the law and he carried the punishment, what would others say? He didn't even have mercy on his own son. He is so ruthless and heartless. Do you see the demise of the king? So you know, do you know what the king did in the story? He said, as a king, I cannot go back on my words. If the law demands two eyes, the law will have two eyes. But I will forgive my son. You can have my two eyes in place of his. 
And when Adam and Eve uh, sin, we were condemned to eternal death. So Jesus had to die our eternal death. Jesus faced hell, which is another word for grave. Jesus faced the lake of fire for all people. Jesus faced eternal death. But wait a second, isn't Jesus God? How can an eternal God truly die an eternal death? Did he really die? Or did he pretend he died? If he pretended he died, then there was no sacrifice. But if he died, then how can he be eternal? Hmm? You know, some people, they came up with this theory that for a moment, Jesus stopped being God. But that doesn't sound right. Because there's no way God can stop being God. God can do that. He's always God. So Jesus did not for a moment lose any of his divine attributes. Okay, then so, so how could he die? It's simple. Imagine you're, okay, imagine you're driving somewhere far from here and um, you see me walking in, on the footpath. And then you stop and you ask, hey, pastor, uh, how are you? Uh, where's your car? And I reply, oh, it's in my garage. It's in my garage. And, and then you say, oh, what happened? Has it broken down? Uh, do you, do you want to lift? And I reply, nah, I just want to just wanna go for a walk today. And you say, what? It's so far. You've walked all this way. I mean, you have a car, so you must use it. You can't walk all this way. If you have a car, you must use it. And I will reply, wait a second. If I must use a car to get here just because I have a car, then who owns who? If I'm obliged to use the car, then the car is my owner. Now, if I'm the owner of the car, then I can choose if I want to use it or not. If the car is still in my garage... Have I stopped owning the car? No, still mine. And am I pretending that I am walking? Or am I actually walking? I'm walking. Jesus did not lose his divinity because he took up human nature. He still owned divinity. Because it's impossible for him to ever stop being God. But in order for you and I to be saved, he had to die. Remember the story of the king who became blind, who lost his eyes. Do you know how God can become blind? By voluntarily closing his eyes. If I close my eyes, have I lost my ability to see? No. I can open my eyes again and I can still see. But when I have my eyes closed, I am in a blinded state. I don't know what you're doing there. The, Bible's, the Bible tells us that um, when Jesus came back to life, he was seen by many. And then he returned to heaven. But do you know what else is mind-blowing? That after Jesus returned to heaven, he continued with his human form. He continued in the form of a human being, and he will be like that for all eternity. Now, I've, I've asked myself this question sometimes. How is he capable of being omnipresent if he has got a human body now? You no. Know, I don't quite know, but the Bible says it's through the Holy Spirit, Spirit, which, by the way, um, is the topic of my next sermon, God the Holy Spirit. But I have no idea how his omnipresence works, how it's possible for Jesus today. I don't know the details, but one thing I know, and the Bible says in Colossians chapter 2, Colossians chapter 2 verse 9, it says, For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. 
the amazing mystery of incarnation. The fullness of God is in a human body. Well, to finish, shall we go back to Philippians chapter 2? That amazing passage found in Philippians chapter 2. Let's go back. And here we read verse 6, and what does it say? Who, being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. So, friends, and then it says there that in verse 8 that in the appearance of a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even the death on the cross. My friends, notice that all the steps that Jesus had to take when he decided to come down to reveal himself to us, it's like walking down a ladder, humbling himself step by step to become the visible image of God. First, as an angel, then through the fire, finally, in human body. He walked down so low. He came down so low, didn't he? All because of love for you. But what happens after Jesus returns to heaven? What happens? He starts to walk the ladder back up. And look at verses 9 to 11, Philippians 2, 9 to 11. As he went back, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That is at the name of Jesus, every name, sh at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wait a second, wasn't Jesus already God? Then why did the Father need to give him the title of God? A title that he never lost. Why? You know, Hebrews tells us that the body that Jesus had before here on earth, uh, the body that he, that veiling of his glory, in hell, um, uh, after, and then he came here on earth when he was incarnated, when he was made flesh. The Hebrews tells us that that body was a little lower than the angels. Psalm 8 also tells us that human beings were created a, li created a little lower than the angels. So imagine, in heaven, Jesus had already made himself nothing, humbled, he humbled himself by taking the likeness of an archangel, the archangel Michael. I mean, he was still above and greater than all. He probably still was the biggest one, he still looked down and the angels were little compared to him. But when he came to earth, he lowered himself even more and then he, by becoming a human, and he returned to heaven with a human body, can you imagine he goes and now he's not looking down at the angels. Now he looks and the angels are taller than him. And he goes back. Does he go back in the likeness of an angel? No. He returns as a human being a little lower than the angels. And how long is he going to be keeping that human body? Forever. Friends, you know, you know, if you ever forget anything that we talked about today, do you know, one thing that you must remember, you know what the coming of Jesus here to this earth the first time, do you know what it meant for him? Never forget that price that Christ paid, the eternal death. And then keeping our human body forever. This is something that really blows my mind. Not only he died, because we often talk, talk about the death and the sacrifice for Jesus, of Jesus for us as a great sign of love. But what about the fact that out of love, he is keeping a human body for eternity? What about that fact? And yes, you may say it's a glorified body. Yes, it is a glorified body. 
But so what? To the Queen of England, the prettiest mansion in Melbourne is only a shack. For somebody like God to veil the fullness of his divinity in a human body, even if glorified, it's an eternal price. And for that reason, the Father gave him a name that's above all names. You know, before the incarnation, God, Jesus was God. At the cross, Jesus was God by nature. But today, He's not only God by nature, He's also God by merit. He's God because of His honor. He deserves to be God. That's why in this text in Hebrew, it says that God before all universe, He gives Jesus this title again because He deserves to have this title, the title of God, even though He's already God. He's God by nature and He's God by character. And He proved that He not only has the power of God, but He has the character of God. In fact, my friends, he fought the devil using his character. Jesus was God. Jesus is God. Jesus will always be God, but he also deserves to be God. And Jesus is so much God that even when he was without the powers of God here on earth, walking as a human, he continued being God because he had the character of God. You know, Lucifer, the devil, as a creature, he always wanted to be like God. But Jesus, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. And he made the decision to spend the rest of his eternity dressed as a creature. Wow. That is why his name is above all names. You know, the scars. Do you have scars on your body? I have some good news for you. Those scars that you have, one day they will disappear on the day of resurrection. But look at this picture. Look at the marks on the hands of Jesus. Those scars will remain forever. And when you see those marks, it's not just to remember that he died for us. It's also to remember, never to forget that Jesus, out of his love for you, chose a life imprisonment in that body. And he thinks that you are worth it. You know, in the United States, do you have you ever watched those movies of the Wild West back in the days of the gold rush? Um, where everything was solved through uh, shooting challenges and uh, one man was condemned and sentenced to the gallows because he killed somebody. And the governor of the city uh, was uh, ready to, you know, issue the, the date of the, the, the sentence to happen. But some people in the city felt pity of the man. And they wrote to the governor, they wrote a letter, please forgive this man. And the, go the governor uh, gave some thought to that, to the message. And he, uh, he thought, well, maybe I can extend him some pardon. And, but before I, I do so, let me carry the pardon notice. I'm going to carry it inside a Bible, and uh, I'm going to go there to check who this person is that I am pardoning. And so the, the governor disguised himself as a priest, and he went to the prison. And when he got there, the man um, saw the, him, the priest, which was the governor, approaching. And the man started to shout, go away. I don't want to hear from you. Get out of here. And the governor replied, no, come down, my friend. No, no, I've just, I've got something for you. I've got something to show you. Get away from here. If you get any closer, I will spit on you and I will spit on this God of yours. No, wait. No, go away. If you get any closer, I'm going to hurt you. The governor shook his head and he turned around and he left. And the prison warden had uh, watched what happened and he approached and he said to the men, are you crazy? Why? That man was not a priest. It was the governor who had a letter of pardon for you. You were going to get released. And on the day of the execution, uh, the man was allowed to say some last words. And he looked at the crowd 
who like you are listening and he said I only want to say one thing I'm not being condemned because of a crime I committed I am being condemned because of a pardoning I refused to accept when the lake of fire that is described in Revelation takes place on this earth people will be there because of the forgiveness they refuse to accept I don't know what is going on in your life and I don't know if um, Christianity is just a once a week thing for you I don't know if you ever do worship at home if you ever read your Bible I don't know how you are going with Jesus maybe not even the people in your family knows what is really going on in your heart I want to remind you of this. Jesus already went to the lake of fire so that you don't have to go there. He was given life imprisonment so that you could have eternal freedom in heaven. The cross paid your sins, paid for your sins, but the consequences of the cross will remain forever. We will know every time we see the scars on his hands. My friends, all we need today is to accept this wonderful God of love. To know who he truly is and ask him to have mercy on us, forgive our sins. And allow him to prepare us and take us to heaven. Would, would you like that to be your experience? Do you want to get serious about your love for Jesus Christ? Or are you going to continue fooling around and following him half-hearted? What do you want? Does Jesus, who humbled himself so much, does he deserve your complete surrender? I would like to, to pray for you. Shall we pray? Let's bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, our gracious Lord, our God, how could we ever stay unmoved, not touched by such a message that we see in the life of Jesus Christ? As we see what you, God, has had to go through in order to show to us how much you love us in order to communicate with us. Oh, Heavenly Father, we can see the measure of your emptying yourself, the extent of it, the measure of your humility. And we confess that we don't deserve it, God. We are sinners. We are not grateful to you. We, we let you down. And we want to ask you, Jesus, please forgive us. Please forgive us, Lord, because we, have, we don't really value what this means, all the whole thing meant to you. Now you carry that in your body forever. Lord, help us to value that more. Help us to think of you every time, every day, every hour. Oh, Heavenly Father, please. We don't want to keep on faking because that's what the devil wants. The devil wants us to just keep on fooling ourselves. But Lord, we pray that you help us to surrender to you completely. To take hold of of what you offer us, which is not only forgiveness, but also transformation, change of heart. And we pray for that today. We pray that you will help every person hearing this message today. Please bless us. 
we pray in the name that is above all names, in Jesus Christ. Amen.